vote for four. The three highest vote totals will get a four-year term. The fourth highest vote, to vote total gets a two-year term. So there are four terms, three four-year terms, one two-year term. The sponsor of this forum is the League of Women Voters, Oakland County. I am Tara Moon, a member of the League of Women Voters, Oakland area. I am not a member of this district. The League of Women Voters is a trusted, national, nonpartisan political organization whose members do the hands-on work to safeguard democracy. While we never endorse a candidate or, an, or a party, we are directly involved in shaping the important issues that keep our community strong. As a League of Women Voters member, I have the opportunity to contribute in a leadership role such as this one that has great impact on local, state, and even national issues. If you are interested in learning about how you can make a similar impact, please ping up, pick up some of our membership information here tonight or visit our website at lwvoa.org. The League of Women Voters does not endorse any candidate or political party. Views expressed in this forum are those of the candidates and we the sponsors take no responsibility. The format for this forum has been established by the League of Women Voters. We ask of the audience that you remain silent throughout the forum and please take a moment right now to turn your cell phones to do not disturb or silent. We ask that the candidates answer the question with their views only and do not interrupt another candidate when they are speaking. The candidates will be answering questions submitted by the audience and screened for duplication and appropriateness by League member Susan Liebetro. Pages Judy Bateman and Shelley Goldberg will be circulating with paper and pencils. So if you think of a question throughout the presentation, um, just raise your hand and Shelley or Judy will come to you with an index <coughs> card and a pencil. When you're ready to turn your question in, just raise your hand up with the card. We're going to do this a little bit differently than we've done our previous forums, if you've ever been to one of our forums before. Uh, because we have so many candidates here tonight, which is great for democracy. Thank you all for running and your interest in um, running the city. We're going to do two question groups. So we'll do one question and six people will get a chance to answer that question. Then we'll change the question and the next six will answer that question. At the end of the presentation, after all the questions are gone through, uh, you'll all get about a minute to address any issues that you didn't get to address in the first time around. And then you also get a closing statement as well. So you get opening, questions, an extra minute, and then a closing statement. Uh, we'll do the question round in alphabetical order, and then the closing statements will be in reverse alphabetical order. Um, I could decide to extend the, that one minute if there's a question, a topic that a lot of questions are coming in on. I might combine a couple questions and give you a minute and a half or two minutes, but I'll make that very clear. And of course, pay attention to Sharon in the front audience there, and she will be letting you know how much time you have left. So uh, residents of Southfield, let me introduce your candidates for the evening. Your candidates are Nancy Banks, Constance Bell, Daniel Brightwell, Latina Denson, Donald Fracassi, Ghana Goodwin Dye, Sarah Habo, Harold Hill, Jason Hoskins, Amani Johnson, Tanya Morris, and Tina Marie Poole. Thank you, candidates, for being here tonight, and thank you, audience, for being here as well. So now we'll begin with opening statements, and we'll start with Ms. Banks. Thank you. Good evening. First of all, I would like to thank the League of Women Voters in the City of Southfield for hosting the forum this evening. My name is Nancy Banks. I'm a lifelong resident of Southfield. I was born here, raised here, educated here, and been a proud graduate of Southfield Public Schools. And my met my husband here, Thomas. We were married St. John's Armenian Church in Southfield. We were blessed with two beautiful children, and I'm proud to say I'm a new grandparent. I am a homeowner, taxpayer, patron of Southfield businesses. Southfield has been my life. I worked in the city of Southfield for 43 years and was your elected city clerk for 19 years. I retired from that position in 2017. I have experience working with elected officials, administrations, and our city council. 
I have the utmost integrity and proven leadership for this position. My years of service with the city combined with my years of service with the city combined with my 19 years as your elected official makes me a highly qualified candidate for council. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Banks. Constance Thank you. Bell. Good evening. My name is Constance Bell. Why am I interested in being elected to the city, South Hill City Council? It's a God-given assignment. I have dedicated half of my life to public service. I have excelled in various leadership roles throughout municipal government, including executive manager for the Planning and Development Department, where I administered a variety of federal funded public service and community development programs in excess of $18 million annually. Before retiring from the city of Detroit, I worked in various departments, including the Finance, Water, and the Human Resources Department. I graduated from Lawrence Technological University with a Bachelor of Science degree in Business Administration. I currently serve as the secretary on the alumni board. I have always taken a leadership role in my community, and I'm currently the president of my homeowners association. I am a public servant at heart, and I sincerely care about the welfare of the residents of the city of Southfield. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Bell. Mr. Daniel Brightwell. I am Dan Brightwell, um, and this is democracy in process. I served in the military so that we could have this particular process of uh, electing our official, officials. I've been on council now for about three and a half years. I'm one of the most impactful um, city councilmen. Uh, one of our senior members said he'd seen in, 30, in 20 years. I passed more resolutions in three years and passed more ordinances in these three years than anyone else on council. I am pleased to, uh, to continue my, uh, my process of being your councilman, and I look forward to it. And, and hopefully before the day is over, you will realize all is well with Brightwell. Thank you, Mr. Brightwell. Latina Denson. Hello, everyone. My name is Latina Denson, and I am, um, I am engaged and ready to serve. Before I start, I wanted to tell you that I had a stroke. So be patient with my speech. I have a speech impairment. However, my brain is on point. I, I am a certified city planner with 20 plus years of experience. Although the stroke tried to break, I mean, tried to knock me out, I like to say that the saying says, the saying goes, um, if if it's not if you don't die, you are um, the, the the you are be better and stronger. So thank you, and I I hope that I will be the fir the only the first and not the first the next city council person. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Denson. Mr. Donald Fricasi. Thank you. As mayor, city councilman, and council president, I've been in service to the city, uh, been elected first time as a councilman in 1967. I became a mayor in 1972 to 2001. 2003, I came back onto the council and I'm presently on the council today. I graduated from Cranbrook School, University of Detroit, LTU, and um, a very well a businessman. And I look at the business part of a very important thing to be on the council of the city, having a business background. And uh, I've had that. I came aboard in my first business. I was 21 years old in the city of Southfield. Yeah, but all me and my family, we have always been you know, in, in with the city. My oldest son, Donald, was a secretary of school board, Southfield School Board. My wife is a, is a fill-in for secretarial at Southfield Schools. My son and daughter are both Levy and Southfield High A&T. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Fakasi. Ms. Ghana goodwin Dye. Good evening. Thank you, League of Women Voters, for putting on this forum. It gives us an opportunity to let the residents know who is running and why we're running. I'm a 30-year resident. I've raised four children here in Southfield. 
I appreciate the service of the council that has been here. I voted for Fercasi for so, such a long time. I decided to run for Southfield City Council because I saw some things that I felt I could improve on. I'm the president of UAW Local 909. I've been the president and elected three times. My experience running a local union and participating and engaging my membership is giving me the qualities necessary to engage and encourage our residents to participate in our government. Too many times our residents come to the council asking for assistance, but they don't get an answer. I'm the type of person that I, if I don't have the answer, thank you. Thank you, Ms. goodwin Dye. Ms. Sarah Habo. Good evening. Thank you, League of Women Voters. My name is Sarah Habo, and I love Southfield, and that's why I'm running for Southfield City Council. I'm a proud Southfield Public School graduate, and the values that I learned as a student in Southfield Public Schools are what led me to go to law school at Michigan State and become an attorney. And as an attorney, I worked for legal aid serving Southfield residents. And in my service to Southfield residents, when Legal Aid and Defender lost its funding and Southfield was going to lose its legal aid clinic that served once a month for free for residents. I stepped up and worked with Rhonda Terry in the Human Services Office to ensure that Lakeshore Legal Aid would step into that role and now the first Friday of every single month, Southfield residents can have free legal services. And that experience of being able to serve my neighbors is what makes me want to serve them in a more direct way as a member of the city council and i hope that you will give me consideration for the election on november 5th thank you thank you miss Havo. mr harold hill hello all <clears throat> first of all i want to reiterate the fact that i wanted to be happy to say that the this is the second time i've got a chance to interview in front of the League of Women Voters, and they've always put on a prestigious event. And so I'm happy to be one of the candidates. My name is Harold Hill. I'm a proud resident of 29 years of the city of Southfield, and I don't plan on leaving. I was encouraged to come here some five years ago because of a 19 million, or excuse me, $99 million bond issue. I thought that was important to see how our city was running. I raised my kids here. I moved to this city because it was safe, clean, and this is a place that I wanted to raise my kids. So this is where I'll be, and I think I can move the city forward for the health of the city as my platform, and I plan to be a proud person to push the agenda forward. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Hill. Mr. Jason Hoskins. Well, good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is Jason Hoskins. It's a pleasure to be here tonight. Uh, just a little bit about me. I, actually live right down the street on Evergreen between 9 and 10 Mile. Uh, I received my bachelor's uh, in political science, my master's in public administration, and my law degree. And for the past several years, in addition to being an adjunct professor at Lawrence Tech, I've had the privilege of serving you. I've served as a legislative aide for our former state representative, Rudy Hobbs, and I currently serve as, state, as a legislative director for our state senator, Jeremy Moss, where I've been able to help craft policies that really help move our city forward. Policies that help keep our neighborhoods vibrant and livable, help give us all the tools we need for economic development here, help keep our government open and accountable and transparent, and, hope, and, and policies that attract and retain people and businesses to our community. It's been a pleasure working for you at the state level, and now I'm hoping to work for you on the city council. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Hoskins. Um, next, Mr. Amani Johnson. Good evening, and thank you to the League of Women Voters for hosting this forum in our community. My name is Amani Johnson. I am a lifelong Southfield resident, proud graduate of Southfield Public Schools, and I've been a member of the Parks and Recreation Board since 2016. I've also worked in the offices of Mayor Brenda Lawrence, State Representative Jeremy Moss, and our current city administrator, Fred Zorn. I graduated from Central Michigan University in 2018 with a degree in public and nonprofit administration, and I currently work as a substitute teacher. Our campaign has also been endorsed by three members of the Southfield School Board, including the school board president and the mayor of Southfield, Ken Cyber. 
Um, I've been the, I'm running for city council because I've been to Southfield High School four or five different times. Each time I talk to different student groups and I always ask them, how many of you want to live here after you graduate high school? And most of them say that they don't. Um, and it seems like it's an issue that people aren't paying enough attention to because the circumstances were the same for me when I was in high school and my peers, in addition to my brothers who also graduated from Southfield late Thrift years before I did. Thank you, Mr. Johnson. Ms. Tanya Morris. Good evening. I am Councilwoman Tanya Morris. I'd like to thank the League of Women Voters and the Southfield Citizens for your participation this evening. When I first ran for office, my focus was on fixing our roads. I hosted a town hall on the roads, working with engineering and public works departments to educate residents on the status of road work, bond funding, and ways to improve quality. I organized and hosted a foreclosure prevention workshop, providing education and resources to residents in an effort to help them keep their homes. I wrote meaningful resolutions to help homeowners redeem their homes and help improve transparency and inclusion when hiring senior management positions. I implemented the Rock the Block program in partnership with Habitat for Humanity, where over 75 residents received exterior home improvements to beautify their homes. Currently, I'm presenting ideas to encourage reinvestment in our city. I want to strengthen our relationship with our small business community, bring more sit-down restaurants to Southfield, clean up our dilapidated strip malls, and make our city more attractive to millennials. I'm running for re-election because I care about the future progress of our city. With your vote, citizens can be confident with my continued leadership, Southfield will move in the right direction. Thank you, Ms. Morris. Tina Marie Poole. Good evening, and thank you, League of Women Voters, for hosting this forum as well. My name is Tina Marie Poole, and I've been a proud resident of Southfield for over 12 years. And having served in the community and serving on various boards, a greater desire arose within me to serve at a different capacity. Wanted to be a part of a larger conversation in terms of having a seat at the table and the decision-making process. Therefore, I announced my candidacy with a motto of advocacy, action, and accountability. I believe and am quite sure that I can be a catalyst for change at the governance level. I currently serve as chair of the Southfield Youth Assistance and I serve on the board of Pace Academy and my master's is in Ed Administration and Policy. I am running because I am passionate about Southfield remaining a vibrant, thriving and progressive community. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Poole. Okay, now we'll start with questions, and we'll start with Ms. Banks first. Economic downturns hurt budgets. What is your plan to balance, balance the budget if revenue drops? Um, thank you. Uh, my plan, first of all, is to, we've got to watch the budget to make sure that the departments um, stay within what was approved by the council. Um, it's also extremely important that we um, save money for the rainy day situations um, should the economy drop and that we have a healthy fund balance. I believe by monitoring the budget monthly and making sure that everyone is on target that we will, we will be fine in the economic downturn situation. We presently do have a fund balance and it's important that we keep and maintain it. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Banks. Ms. Bell. Yes. It's happened before when the economy changed and it's sort of like what you have at your home. You want to make sure that you save for that rainy day and have a surplus. And you want to make sure that every position, every, uh, all the resources are accounted for. You want to make sure again that there's no waste and making sure that the, the budget's balanced. Thank you, Ms. Bell. Mr. Brightwell? Uh, when, I, when I got on council, I became the finance committee chair I think that's the first time in the history of Southfield that a new councilman chair of the Finance Committee. I have an MBA in finance. I instituted the monthly budget versus actual report, which tells us specifically how much is being spent and how much is actually going out. And that report now is being disseminated uh, all through the city. One thing that we can control is expenses. We cannot control our revenue. So by monthly taking a look at our expenses, we can make sure that when, when departments are going a little bit above their budget, we can call them in and uh, we can correct that. But the main thing of it is monitoring, and I instituted a system in the city as the uh, finance committee chair. I've been the chair for three years now. 
one year I was council president, so um, I am amply suited to uh, watch the budget of the city of Southfield, and I have been doing that. And we added $7.1 million to our rainy day fund since I've been chair of the finance committee. Thank you, Mr. Brightwell. <coughs> Ms. Denson? Thank you. Um, as a uh, planning commissioner, um, we are um, we are in charge of the um, co um, capital improvement program, and what that is is um, every department has to um, identify what their um, their needs are and project for a five-year um, 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 a five-year program and so what what I want what I would l like to do is make sure that every department is on task and on point in terms of what they are spending um, every every year and actually every three months so that we can adjust it as we fit as we see fit thank you Ms. Dunson Mr. Fricasi yes budget is very very important to not only uh, the city of Southfield but when you're a businessman you know we have to look at how we spend money and in our payroll and how much things cost to stay alive and it's one thing to um, to see our budgets for cities and try to compare, compare them to, to being in business for yourself. Uh, there's uh, one of those things that when you open it up, you know, each year and try to find out what you're going to keep, what you're going to get rid of, it's a very hard thing to do. Mm -hmm. And I think Southfield does a very good job at, with it. Uh, but the other thing is is make sure you get good employees working for you. And because, you know, they want to stay in business with you because that's how they make their living. And so uh, budget is very, very important. I like to make sure that people do not, individuals at the city do not take money out of one person's budget into another one because they used all their money. So I watch it pretty close. Thank you, Mr. Fricasi. Ms. goodwin Dye. Yes, um, as president of UAW Local 909, We've had to co cut costs since not 2008. And we started at the top. We had to start cutting our costs with our wages, which I hate doing. We had to do more time working inside the plant. So I understand that budgets have to be maintained. We also started putting more aside so that we could maintain our budget and pay our bills. I believe that when it's necessary to have to make cuts, it should always come from the top and not the bottom. I don't think that any of our services should be hindered. They should always remain in place because the safety of our residents is most important. Thank you, Ms. goodwin Dye. All right, Ms. Habo, you're going to get a new question. And again, if any of you guys want to respond to the question just asked, you can or you can answer this question and you all will get a chance to answer this question at the very end. Um, Ms. Habo, the question is, what can you do to bring businesses to Southfield that will attract a youthful base while not disenfranchising our senior community? So, I think one of the best things that we can do is actually empower our young people to play a role in this. And so one thing that I want to create is a youth advisory board made up of middle and high school students. And with a board, these students could be given an issue and then issue a recommendation to the city council. So if we want to add, you know, a dog park or something that we think young people would want to have in their communities, we just give it to young people and have them research it and issue a recommendation to the city council and trust that with the support of city officials that we can vet their suggestions and work in that way so that we're not only 
working to help small businesses and bringing other businesses into our community, we're actually empowering the young people in our community so they have access to resources and opportunities in their future as well. Thank you, Ms. Hubbell. Mr. Hill. <clears throat> that is a very important question because if you do not bring the youth leaders of tomorrow, your city will die. And it will die because you're not taking care of watching your monies. I'm thinking that if you really look at it closely, my son had mentioned the same thing, but if we take some of the schools that have been, let's say, closed and turn them into rec centers for the youth, bring basketball back to the inner city of Southfield. They have taken down all of the basketball rims because they thought it was unsafe. Bring back something fun for the children to do and keep the, of course, keep the finances in hand. We probably could have taken Northland and turned it into a more fun area. I see, when I went to California, they had Knott's Berry's Farm. They turned that into a fun zone. It's about the same size as Northland, and we could have used that to do an amusement park like Edgewater. Something simple like that to help the youth come back. And that will keep our seniors happy too. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Hill. Mr. Hoskins. <laughs> you know, I don't think the two are mutually exclusive. I think a lot of things that young people want to do, older people want to do. I think that when you go to, and this is one of the biggest things that come up, that comes up when I'm canvassing. Um, I think when you ask, what, what do you like to do here in Southfield? What would you like to see here in Southfield? I get, I like to see more restaurants. I like to see more um, life, more after hours activity. Uh, I like to be able to walk, I have a more uh, downtown kind of feel. And those are the things that kind of attract and retain people young and old to our community. You see it in places like Royal Oak, you see it in places like Ferndale and Birmingham. These are the kind of things that people are looking for and I think that kind of transcends age. Thank you, Mr. Hoskins. Mr. Johnson. Um, I also don't necessarily believe that having young people here, young professionals, young families here in this community will be a burden on our older population. Um, I talk to residents all the time about where they shop at, where they eat. Residents say they shop at places like Target and Meyer and Kroger. Um, they're eating at TGI Fridays and Applebee's, but Southfield severely lacks small businesses and small, bi small locally owned establishments owned by people that actually live in this community. Um, if you go to where young people are moving, it's Ferndale, it's Farmington, it's Royal Oak, Birmingham, downtown Detroit, and all of them have a wide array of small um, locally owned establishments. You can walk down one street, go to a brewery, go to the movies, go to a bookstore, and have all these great experiences all at once. And if we can't at least provide that, we should be making sure that we're providing spaces for small businesses with less square footage to make it more affordable for the people who live here to rent our retail spaces. Thank you, Mr. Johnson. Ms. Morris. As chair of the Economic Development Committee, uh, we've recently be talk been talking about uh, trying to come up with a strategic marketing plan uh, for the city to attract uh, millennials. Uh, one of the city's goals this fiscal year is uh, to do just that, create a um, strategic marketing plan for the city. Uh, so we're interested in doing that. And like um, my colleague here, uh, Jason, said, they are not mutually exclusive. I'm sure that we can come up with something that will not disenfranchise seniors. Um, I'm also scheduled for a uh, trip uh, in Chicago with the International Council on Shopping Centers, where we'll be meeting with uh, various top retailers in that city and trying to understand what are some of their uh, expansion plans. And uh, we have meetings set up so that we can uh, try to see if they'd be interested in coming to Southfield, what we have for them, what they have for us. Uh, we're very interested in um, making our, our city uh, more walkable, more pedestrian friendly. Uh, we were just in Royal Oak last night for dinner. Uh, tons of people were out walking around. That's something that we like to see for our city because it'd be more attractive to, to the younger generation. Thank you, Ms. Morris. Ms. Poole. Sure, so as chair of the Southfield Youth Assistance, one of the things that we have done within the community is to establish entrepreneurial training programs specifically for youth. 
We have partnered with the Southfield Public Schools specifically because we want to hear the voice of the next leaders, the next generations. And so one of the things that we have asked them in this forum is what would you like to see happen within Southfield? What kind of businesses are you interested in? One of the things that they tell us is they don't believe that they have a voice. They don't believe that the city is listening to them. They feel like they're not valued. And so again, one of the things that we're trying to do is merge the wisdom and then the energy and the forward thinking and the critical thinking within youth and combine the two so that we can move the city forward. Thank you, Ms. Poole. Okay, the next question will start with Ms. Bell. What will you do to ensure the corporation that purchased the former Northland Mall will follow through on their promise to build condos, senior living, and other promises to enhance our community? You would have to go back to the actual contract and uh, they should have a site plan that they clearly understand and we have to monitor. We want to make sure that if they say something's going to be done within a certain time frame, then that time needs to be met, needs to be closely monitored again. And again, it has to be in the contract where we want to make sure that the city officials are making sure that the timelines are followed. Anytime you have a, a development, there are stipulations that things have to be done at a particular time. We want consistency. We want to make sure that we not only hold the developer accountable, but make sure that the building department or the planning department, whatever city officials are doing their job, and it's so important, especially when it's a big development like, like Northland. Um, unfortunately, that's not anything that I would have voted for, but we want to make sure again that, that, is, is, that they're meeting their time frame. Thank you, Ms. Bell. Mr. Brightwell. I, I actually, <clears throat> excuse me, I do have a call. Um, I actually sit on the Northland Committee, and uh, we have a purchase and sell agreement with uh, a couple of developers. And specifically, one of the things that I mandated was that anything that we agree to will have to go through site plan and have to go through planning before it is uh, actually implemented. And whatever they presented to us as a sketch or an outline, that is what we approve. It should be a mixed-use development. It's not going to be all, well, I'm not going to use the word, but we do have mixed-use that's coming there, uh, automobile dealership that's coming there, and Providence will also be consuming some of the land. Uh, but there will be a mixed-use. Uh, there will be uh, Pacific guidelines according to our site plan and also our, our planning department. Nothing will go up that, that was not approved. And so I, I was adamant about that. And uh, as, as a member of the North Land Committee, I can make sure those things happen. Thank you, Mr. Brightwell. Uh, Ms. Denson. Thank you. Um, when the, the city purchased South, um, South, uh, North Land, they had a vision, visioning session. And the visioning session, um, the residents said that they wanted um, mixed use developments, um, housing, commercial, um, re um, retail. And th I thought that and, and, and they thought that, they, that the city was going to comply. Now we have a, another um, use of medical marijuana. And some of them, some of the residents really don't know or know, but they feel like they are, um, voiceless. I really didn't know, I didn't want to go to the marijuana, m medical marijuana, not at th this, that location. I thought, I think that we could have done better. Um, and the price that the city is 
selling it to, uh, from, I mean, for is, I think we should, we could have done better and um, that's it. Thank you, Ms. Denson. Mr. Fricasi. Yeah, I think that uh, that's one of my favorite projects is, is Northland. Someone once told me, uh, Fricasi, you know, you should FSS, fill seeds, sell and get out of that place because it's 125 acres and uh, the plan, the original plan was, was great. As a matter of fact, it won an award. But since that time, they have gone off that. We had a church at uh, Owen Penny Building, and they moved over to the Northland Theater, and then the city gave them five acres, sold them five acres in a parking lot, Northland. And I, and I guess I look at all those things that are happening with it, and, and I really believe when five some years ago when they were talking about it, and I asked, other developers what to do, they, um, they said to do what they said. But I'm gonna tell you that I think there's a, it's gonna be a big job, gonna cost a lot of money, and uh, I really you do not like the sale price of what is being offered right now. Everybody's looking for these big, big acreage now, and right now there's 125 acres, you got the summit, you got the palace, and you, you got uh, Summit Salad, and, and Friedman's Tech, and, and, you know, and so I'm trying to say that everybody wants this property. <coughs> and what we, I wanted to do was build a tech park there, change the name of Northland, put something in there that can, well, uh, serve the, the neighborhood and our residents, and they get something that you can get on a bus and go to and go to work, <laughs> and we'll have more employees employed in that location. Thank you, Mr. Fricasi. Ms. goodwin Dye. Thank you for that question. Well, you got to talk fast, huh? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, I was here when the proposal came out, and the first thing that I noticed was that the down payment, um, the good faith fee, was not large enough. They have way too much time to think about what they're going to do with our property. I believe that if they really wanted to do something good for this community, that the good faith down payment would have been a lot larger. I believe that language should be implemented in that proposal that holds them liable to utilize our vision in concert with theirs. I believe that we can bargain and come to a middle ground to make that property the, what, what Southfield deserves. We need something that will encourage our young people to come and participate. We need something for our seniors to do on that property as well. That's my vision. Thank you, Ms. goodwin -Dye. Ms. Banks. Could you please repeat the question? Of course, yes. Uh, where did I put it though? Here it is. What will you do to ensure the corporation that purchased the former Northland Mall will follow through on their promise to build condos, senior living, and other promises to enhance our community? Thank you. Um, well, first of all, we, um, they will have to submit a site plan um, for approval by the Planning Commission and the City Council. Originally, the city did have a beautiful plan, and it was a mixed-use plan involving um, Providence Hospital, um, the condos, and it seems like it has changed at this point. It's my understanding that they're, taught, they're looking to develop a strip center. Um, Providence Hospital still wants to take some of the property that is there. Um, I have heard that um, a health club is interested in going. And in developing the property, uh, the original plan also had a park-like setting. <laughs> And hopefully the new developer, developers will work with the city to create um, that type of an atmosphere for everyone um, to enjoy. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Banks. All right, uh, now we're moving on to group two and we're gonna start with Mr. Hill for this one. What is your plan or what do you suggest regarding marijuana dispensaries? <coughs> <clears throat> well, thank you for starting with me because at the gateway of our city, I never thought that that would be a, a positive 
platform for the health of my city is something that I truly believe in and it's my platform and I know that the people have voted for it but I've got to tell you knowing that these dispensaries can cause damage and harm to the youth of our community I am not for it I probably will never be for it and if it does happen they should diversify and make sure that everybody has a piece of the pie which doesn't seem to happen often it seems as though somebody comes in and takes their portion but for one thing I think it causes damage to the youth it's federally illegal you can't put deposit monies into the bank and it also causes harm to the youth and it ends up in the school system so I'm sorry but for me that is and I've been in the healthcare industry all of my life and I know what the damage it can do. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Hill. <coughs> Mr. Hoskins. <clears throat> Maybe this is a, a generational thing, but um, I, so I voted for, uh, as many South Elders did, um, a vast majority of South Elders did, voted for both medical marijuana and uh, recreational marijuana. I know that I am not there or recreational marijuana being uh, sold here in our city. Um, and I know on Monday, we uh, put together the framework here um, for allowing medical marijuana uh, in one of the sites at the Northland uh, property. Um, as Mr. Hill said, you know, this is the gateway of our community. Uh, and I know there have been a number of concerns about having medical marijuana sold at, uh, at the Northland site potentially. Uh, I, don't have that, I don't have those same concerns. Uh, I am a little nervous about having it at that site, though. Um, I know that this is just the beginning of a process. We are simply putting a framework into place, and we have many, 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 many steps to go before we even consider having dispensaries in our city. And when they do come here, I'll be, of course, listening to our citizens and their concerns. Thank you, Mr. Hoskins. Mr. Johnson. Well, despite the fact that over two-thirds of Southfield residents voted for um, recreational marijuana, I agree with the city's decision to opt out of the proposal, just because we, it's brand new, it's very experimental, and I think it's important to see how it goes in other communities before we bring that sort of thing into ours, if we even want to. So I think that that was a good decision on their part. Thank you, Mr. Johnson. Ms. Morris. Yes, um, I too voted for uh, medical marijuana when it was on the state's ballot. However, I did not vote for uh, recreational marijuana. And I do know that uh, overwhelmingly uh, citizens of Southfield did vote to have um, medical and recreational uh, here uh, in the city of Southfield. Um, but I just believe just because something is popular, that, that doesn't mean that it's right. Uh, for the community, and I just, I'm not in a position right now where I am uh, ready to support dispensaries. I did not want it at uh, North, the Northland site, um, and um, I'd just like to get more feedback and, and do a little bit more research. Uh, there's only 33 states that have approved medical marijuana. I think there's 11 states that have, have approved recreational. So we do need to get a little bit more information in terms of regulations, and um, uh, that's, that's my answer. Thank you, Ms. Morris. Ms. Poole. So I, I want to say that I was extremely disappointed with Council's decision to move forward with regards to the Northland property and allowing the dispensaries there. I don't see the value that it's adding to our community. Southfield is a wonderful, vibrant community full of families, seniors, youth, and we say that we're the center of it all. I just find it hard to believe that we made a rush to judgment in terms of allowing this to come into our city without thinking through the entire process. Do I agree that medical marijuana should be allowed? Absolutely. If that is going to assist our residents and our community toward a healthier lifestyle and being relieved of pain, absolutely. But the recreational use, I'm convinced that we have not thought it through and we don't understand the negative ramifications specifically for our youth. Thank you, Ms. Poole. Ms. Habo. Can you repeat the question, please? Yes. What do you plan or what do you suggest regarding marijuana dispensaries? 
Okay, so one of my major concerns is that I have a hard time believing that anyone should profit off of marijuana sales while we have so many, it's millions of people who are currently in jail and in prison for having used or sold marijuana, and it's predominantly in communities of color who have been affected by the implementation of the war on drugs. And so to me, it's problematic to allow people to profit while we have people sitting in jail for nonviolent crimes related to drugs. When you think about how we would implement something because things have passed in this state and medical marijuana is legal in the state and recreational marijuana is also legal in the state, if we have to create legislation and zones for allowing these dispensaries or to consider whether dispensaries will be allowed, we have to limit where they are and limit who has access to them to protect the young people in our community and those who may not have had their brains developed enough to be able to make use of whatever the benefits are. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Hubbell. All right, the next question, we'll start with Mr. Brightwell. Um, I'm gonna combine two questions. Um, they're kind of similar. Uh, one question is, what is your position regarding regulations of Airbnb rentals? And the other question is, what is your position on regulation of ride-sharing services like Uber and Lyft? Well, I'm, um, I'm for regulating items that deal with the public. Uh, I, I come out of a structure, uh, corporate America, that when we know that when things are not regulated and are monitored, uh, people will attempt to profit from those particular items and they will not uh, treat those particular items as though they were theirs. Uh, in regulating Airbnbs, they, I've heard of some uh, horrible cases around the world where individuals go to homes and uh, they are not specifically what they thought they would be. And as far as ride sharing, uh, I, am, uh, I, I would want them to be, the drivers and those companies to be regulated like we regulate uh, taxi, taxi cabs because uh, the individuals who are, you're putting your life in your hand when you get into um, a Lyft or um, <coughs> Uber, uh, and I want that person driving me around to be, have been vetted, to be checked out. He's not a mass murderer. He's not a serial killer. Uh, so I want, and he has a driver's license. So <laughs> that, that I'm, I'm for regulation. And uh, just one thing, I believe in monitoring. You get what you monitor. And so this is a corporate tool that I use. What I monitored, I got from a, uh, from a performance standpoint. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Brightwell. Ms. Denson. Thank you. Um, in terms of um, <coughs> the re re regulations for both the um, a, 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 I mean, R, I mean, air and air, air, and air and these um the uh ride ride services um i think that when we talk about those uses definitely have some regulations however too much i mean too many regulations are um, are not, I mean, are, can keep businesses out of Southfield. Um, I have known, um, even when I was not in Southfield, that Southfield has a, a, um, re a re reputation of too many regulations, so they don't really want to um, come here. And so when we talk about regulations, yes, I, I know, I mean, I, I agree to that we have to have regulations, but too much, I mean, too many regulations are, um, a um, decurrent, I mean, deterrent. Thank you, Ms. Dunson. Mr. Fricassi. 
Could you repeat the question, please? Yes. What is your position regarding regulation of Airbnb rentals and regulation of ride-sharing services like Uber and Lyft? Well, I, um, first of all, I want to talk slower because I can't get what I want to say in a minute. But anyway, I think that uh, we have a spot right there at uh, Lasha Road and 11 Mile Road, which is the MDOTs, and uh, they uh, presently have the old library on the corner and it's really not used like it really should have. And um, I'd like to do something really out of this, uh, uh, out of your head, I guess I call it, is that I'd like to see these, these cars that are going for like Ford Motor Company, driverless car, have a lane going all the way down to Detroit, and that they build a three-deck parking lot on that site with commercial on the main floor, and people who could go, drive down to that point get on a driverless car, you have a lane right down the expressway, take you right down to Detroit, and it would really be something that we could do. One time I was even talking about having a monorail going from Detroit to, to Southfield because we had 27 million square feet of office space and we should be working together rather than trying to steal from each other. Thank you, Mr. Fakasi. Ms. goodwin Die. Thank you. I believe that there should be some regulations on Airbnb for the simple fact that if you have too many Airbnbs in the areas, it might affect the property values, especially if they're not taken care of. I know in Chicago, I went to visit and there was a company that owned an entire apartment complex and they were all Airbnb and they rented them out. But the regulations there stipulated that they had to keep the properties up. Also with the ride share, I agree with Mr. Brightwell that there should be some regulations because I don't want my children and my grandchildren to get into a Lyft or an Uber and not know who's driving those vehicles. It is important that we make regulations that keep our community safe. Thank you, Ms. goodwin Dye. Ms. Banks. Thank you. Um, with reference to Airbnbs, um, it's an interesting question. Um, we, our family personally has stayed in many Airbnbs and we've enjoyed it. Um, if we approve something like that in the city, I think that first of all, there needs to be strong enforcement of the actual facility. Um, it, the property should be zoned properly. Um, the building department needs to make sure that the house is number one up to code and in top-notch top condition so that Southfield does not receive a negative um, rating um, on the particular home. Um, with reference to the rideshare, Airbnb, I mean rideshare, Uber and Lyft, um, many of the young adults and even the senior population utilize the program because there seems to be a limit of the taxi cabs. And I know at one time the city used to license taxi cabs, but now it's licensed by the state of Michigan. Thank you. Time is up. <laughs> Thank you, Ms. Banks. Ms. Bell, you, the same question. Yes. Airbnbs, uh, I think that they need to be if we have them, they need to be zoned. I don't think they should be in our communities because you have people, different people uh, from different areas moving in. You, you never know who is living next door to you, even if it's temporary. And I, uh, we want to stabilize our community. So I don't think that would be a good idea for the communities, but perhaps if it's zoned. As far as the shared driving, I think, shared riding, I think that regulations to a certain point, but when the city government or any type of government gets involved in things, sometimes there are additional fees. And one thing about the shared riding, the prices seem to be affordable. Uh, again, I just think that they need to be, uh, perhaps to a certain point, they need to be um, monitored, but not where the city or a government gets involved where there's too many regulations where, in fact, it, people decide not to even have them any longer because anytime you think about regulations, I think about money and I think about taxes and I think about any, any type of financial. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Ms. Bell. Mm -hmm. Okay, a new question. 
Um, we'll start with Mr. Hoskins this time. What will you do to hold apartment owners, apartment owners in the city accountable for the living conditions of the residents and the upkeep of the property? Yep, <clears throat> this is something that um, we've definitely had to look at uh, at the state level as well. When we had a uh, problem apartment complex, um, who unfortunately a number of uh, their services went out. And I know one of the things that we looked at at the state level, uh, the, the, there was an issue with the elevators going out and the boilers going out, and those things are regulated by the state. And this is one of the good, uh, good things about being in the position that I'm in, <laughs> is that I, I applaud the city for the ordinance they put in place to be able to be able to crack down on these problem uh, landlords and property managers, um, but I know there are other tools that are at our disposal, and those are the things that I've been able to work on at the state level, making sure that, uh, in this instance, that our elevators, the elevators are working properly, making sure that there's uh, more resources available for people to be able to inspect these, because that is something that uh, we were surprised to hear that in that particular instance, elevators hadn't been looked at since 2005. Uh, and it's something that we wanted to look into and make sure we had all the resources available for any city Thank to be you, able Mr. to regulate. Thank you, Mr. Haskins. Mr. Johnson. Um, so I think that a big part of holding apartment complexes accountable is code enforcement. And I, um, something that I've noticed while knocking doors throughout the summer is how many code violations there are in the neighborhoods and how much easier it would be to identify those if people or if the officers were walking the streets just like we are. And I think it's the same when it comes to apartment complexes, um, walking around those, identifying issues. And I think part of it is also connecting with residents who live in apartment complexes. Often, I live in an apartment complex, live at Franklin River Apartments, um, and oftentimes those residents are disconnected from the city, from the other residents that live here because they Maybe they just moved here last year, or they, um, just, they just don't have as much contact with people who live in the neighborhoods. So reaching out to those residents and making sure that they have an avenue to make complaints when there is an issue is something that would be beneficial. Thank you, Mr. Johnson. Ms. Morris. So yes, we did have an apartment owner who uh, had an emergent issue, and uh, there were some issues in his building uh, as a result. And uh, we did implement an ordinance uh, that allows us to uh, have the building inspectors go out. It's called the Building Inspection Ordinance, and to go out frequently and inspect uh, various apartment buildings. As a result, we had to hire uh, more building inspectors. Um, and so that's one thing that we did, and we've seen uh, some great improvement, uh, it's particularly with the one uh, apartment owner uh, that we've had uh, some problems with. Most of the issues that were documented in terms of findings uh, fees and inspections uh, have been improved uh, since we implemented that ordinance. Thank you, Ms. Morris. Ms. Poole. So the, the goal of code enforcement as it pertains to apartments is to ensure that our residents are in a safe and healthy environment. And the key is code enforcement and actually reinforcing the code enforcement. And where there are opportunities or incidences where it's been violated, I would suggest applying very strict fines. And if it continues, then I think that the apartment complex should be shut down. Thank you, Ms. Poole. Ms. Habo. As a legal aid attorney, this is something that we dealt with a lot, and I had to represent clients in dealing with not having heat in their apartments, not having air conditioning in their apartments, having water shut off in their apartments. And so one of the most important things that you can do is to ensure that inspections are done regularly and that the fines that the apartment owners are um, charged with, that they're high enough that it means it's worthwhile for them to actually make the repairs because often you find people and they just pay the fine and they don't actually improve the complex itself. And so we have to ensure that our fines are actually related to our high enough that it would require somebody to make repairs and also that when we're doing inspections, we do follow up inspections to ensure that the repairs have actually been made in a way that they don't just meet code, but that it's safe for, um, for people to be able to like be into their homes, so, like ensuring that you've actually inspected the place, not just trusting 
what the apartment complexes have said because they've done that in the past and have actually not repaired the issues that they've claimed they've repaired. Thank you, Ms. Havel. Mr. Hill. It was kind of shocking to find out that some of the infractions that were caused by one of the complexes were being done. As a matter of fact, they came in front of us to get a tax abatement for the same complex. And I think they need to make more codes in the, in the literature to show the conduct of what apartment buildings should do. They need to have more code enforcement going out to each and every apartment to make sure that there's a standard of care because our residents deserve that. This is Southfield. We are well respected here and people should be able to live in a non-threatening manner. They should live in a healthy environment. When a furnace goes out, the management should be properly fined if they don't get that done or send out those residents. And it has happened, and I'm proud to see that our code enforcement has been doing a much better job for setting code enforcement out and restricting those types of neglect environments to our people and residents of Southfield. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Hill. Okay, a new question. And we will start with Mrs. Denson. How do you plan to be a more inclusive city, especially to those who fall in the area of ADA? Thank you. Um, the ADA, um, the city has not really Com um, con conform to the ADA um, standards. When you when you think about this complex, um, I have a problem with every part of the complex in terms of the. Um, walkable uh, walkability of the um, buildings if if I go to the police station it's too many stairs or if I but if I don't but if I have to walk it's a, a long walk to the actual door um, they just installed a door and a um, a camera to the mayor's office and the uh, city administrator. However, if I am in a wheelchair, I cannot reach the buttons to talk to someone so that they can open the door and then the door is is extremely heavy and so when when we talk about um exclusive i mean inclusiveness not only in 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 terms of ada um standards but in general um we talk about how we are a um, a diverse population or a diverse, a diverse, a diverse um, community. However, the so, some people don't 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 think that they are welcomed. Thank you, Ms. Denson. Mr. Fakasi. Yes. The city council is looking at that and have been working on it for quite a while with these buildings that we have. The buildings were built way back some time when it was not important. You had stairways and we have an elevator up that takes you upstairs in this building. It still is an ADA. You had a lot of things, but we just went through Monday when we probably had 60 items that we were going to spend a lot of money on to redo portions of this building 
Now, the, the people who own apartment complexes, you now we get some outsiders that buy these things, and I'll use the word, they bleed them to death, and uh, they make them unlivable, and then they cut the rent to keep the people there, and it, do, it doesn't really work. I think that they get a certain amount of time to fix them up, and that they apply to all the rules and regulations to or shut them down. Thank you, Mr. Fricasi. Ms. goodwin Dye. Um, I hadn't even thought about this, and I'm just going to be honest. Um, I believe that we should partner with the businesses and the communities that have adults with disabilities and come together with solutions and set priorities on how we're going to address them and include the businesses in getting those projects finished. Thank you, Ms. goodwin Dye. Ms. Banks. Thank you. Um, I think we definitely need to do a better job when it comes to um, the ADA community. I know in the city hall complex here, we are slowly trying to um, you know, put the buttons to push the buttons to open the door, et cetera. But many of our businesses are not even in compliance. And I just don't even know why they haven't been inspected. I have a brother who has a disability, and sometimes when he goes um, to some of the businesses here in Southfield, he cannot open the door. He cannot even go to the restroom. So we need to have um, a better system for enforcing the biz enforcing the businesses within our community to comply with the ADA rules. Um, and if the businesses aren't cooperating, we need to work stronger with the state of Michigan because they also are not complying. And I just, I'm not even sure if I understand why, but it's, it's shameful. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Banks. Ms. Bell. Yes. I recognize that it is a problem, and it's actually mm -hmm. the federal law mm -hmm. that's not being enforced. Mm -hmm. You can see the, the sidewalks um, where they're supposed to have certain materials to, so that a person would not continue to roll in the street. And there are so many things that we can do to, to make them feel at home, to make our, our uh, citizens feel at home, but we have to start right here. If we're not doing it within our own city, structures to city buildings then how do we go out and, and tell the business owners that they need to do it so we need to take a this needs to be a priority and it needs to be something that's discussed and taken care of right away mm -hmm. thank you miss bell mr brightwell in my first year on council I, I asked for a comprehensive need assessment for all our property and uh it finally this year we have enough money in the budget approximately two hundred fifty thousand. we're going to look at all our property in the city, including the library, look at it from a standpoint of uh, infrastructure need, and that is a process that is uh, uh, that that is being done. And I directed that from the finance committee to look at the, the uh, comprehensive needs assessment. And just for, for a moment, on the prior question about apartments, um, I initiated the process of how they would in, inspect our apartments. I laid out the process, and also I laid out the the uh, uh, the scientific methodology of actually looking at the apartment and plus I gave them a template I got a template from another city of apartment complexes so I provide provided that to our building department so we are you know Southfield is we are moving along it's a old city but it's about like your house you have a list of things you need to need to be done and so with this comprehensive need assessment we will prioritize all the things that need to be done and ADA will definitely be a part of that thank you mr. Brightwell a uh, new question, we'll start with Mr. Johnson. How do you plan to involve city stakeholders, i.e. residents, businesses, city employees, et cetera, in the decision-making process in Southfield? Um, well, one of the things that I've seen a lot of other communities do is particip participatory budgeting, um, meaning that residents get to have some control over where some of the funds that, um, ha that are in the city's budget go to, so that you can see what the priorities of the residents are versus the priorities of the council itself. Um, the next piece is making sure that we are 
um, including young people in this community when it comes to our boards and commissions, um, different internship and job opportunities within the city itself, so that they're actually getting involved from a young age. And we have to go to them and take these opportunities to them, because otherwise they won't uh, ever end up coming and doing it themselves. Thank you, Mr. Johnson. Ms. Morris? Yes, I do think we need to uh, make a better effort uh, to educate our stakeholders on ways that they can be more involved. We do have a, a variety of boards and commissions that they can serve on. Uh, they come and share their comments and give their feedbacks at um, our uh, various uh, public hearings uh, and the council meetings. Uh, but perhaps there's something that we could uh, put on our website and we have people that are um, technology inclined, uh, maybe even from the mobile phone, where we can um, invite them to participate um, and uh, volunteer in different uh, programs and steering committees that we have uh, to make them be more inclusive and uh, to ha have their voices heard. Thank you, Ms. Morris. Ms. Poole. So I think that community engagement is key in terms of our residents and actually hearing the voices and the concerns of the residents. In order for us to advocate on their behalf, we have to know and hear their interests. So I would suggest that there would be more forums that are available to increase communication between the citizens and government and then move forward from there. And then that can include them serving on various boards, policies, et cetera, in order for them to uh, be more participatory in the decision-making process. Thank you, Ms. Poole. Ms. Habo? Thank you. One of the things I'd like to see is more of the corporations we have in Southfield helping pay for some internships for the students of Southfield Public Schools. I'd like to see them have a tie to our community more directly than just being able to get tax abatements. Um, I'd like to also see the boards and commissions to, to be more accessible because some of these boards and commissions meet during times that working people are unable to attend. Um, and I'd also like to host more town halls with uh, neighborhood associations so that people who are already active have a role in being even more active and engaging the rest of their neighbors in the process of talking about issues that we have in our communities because they overlap. And then I'd also like to use students uh, through an internship to have them work as community liaisons going into the neighborhoods, finding the issues that residents have so that we are more of a community-focused government. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Havel. Mr. Hill. One of the things I think we need to do, and after canvassing, I found out that people just are not in the know. And I think that if we in government go out to talk to people in the neighborhoods, in businesses, once a month, invite them to town halls, open up different programs so that we can meet together to find out what the important issues are. Because there's a lot of things out there that people just don't know. And if we are engaged, and I plan on being engaged with those businesses to find out what's important to them, because our people and our government should do that. We've forgotten that part. Sometimes we sit on the ivory tower and we forget that they are the reason why we're there. So more town halls, even meet them where they are. Possibly a phone app to get the information directly to them. A lot of younger people use their phones all the time. So if you come up with a phone app to have information where they can address it instantly, that's something that will help get information to the masses. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Hill. Mr. Hoskins. <clears throat> so in my position in uh, Senator Moss's office, every month, um, we do a number of town halls, uh, coffee hours, engaging with our community, letting them know what's going on, certainly at the state level. And if I am so lucky to be uh, elected to the city council, I'm going to still be continuing to be uh, in Senator Moss's office. And I know that's one, uh, one way that I will be able to let people know what is going on in our community. Um, I'm able, we are lucky to have such an engaged um, city. Uh, we always have a good number of people turn out, but also kind of to echo what a lot of other people were saying, I do want to make sure we are using technology to the best uh, of our ability. I know um, uh, Councilwoman Moore has brought up boards and commissions. I know it's very difficult to find out what commissions are available, uh, what, uh, what you have to do to apply, even applying um, if it was just easier to apply online, like you have to turn in an application in person. 
uh, if you want to be on a board of commission. So little things like that uh, could be really helpful to engaging stakeholders in our community. Thank you, Mr. Hoskins. A uh, new question. We will start with Mr. Fercasi. Um, what is your plan to improve the relationship with the governor to foster resources and support for our community health? Repeat the last part of that. What is your plan to improve the relationship with the governor to foster resources and support for community health? Well, I think that the city has a good liaison with the governor. I think that she has a, a, um, she has a tune to the city. She was here for the, for a couple of weeks ago, I guess a month ago. And uh, I think that for the census, I think we can work with them. And it's, of course, hard and difficult to get people out. That's the worst part that is doing it. And the council has a, an opportunity to have people come in and answer their questions. If they come in, we have an open house, supposedly, right, at every council meeting. Anyone can sign up and get three minutes to talk, and, and we take down what their problems are, and we address it. And, and I just have to find newer, better ways of getting people out of the house, and getting them off their cell phones, and get them into here so we can talk about things. And let us know if something's bothering you. Something's bothering you in the neighborhood. You just come forward and call. We're all available. Thank you, Mr. Fercasi. Ms. Goodwin Dye. Could you repeat the question, please? Yes. I have a hard time hearing. No what is your plan to improve the relationship with the governor to foster resources and support for community health? I am not sure. I would have to really think about that question. Okay, thank you. Uh, Ms. Banks. Thank you. Um, I think that it might be important that we appoint a liaison or a committee to work extremely close with the governor, and then together we can um, host town hall meetings um, to discuss um, the community health issues that people may have within the community. Thank, Thank you, Ms. You. Banks. Ms. Bell? I'm not sure what the current relationship is with the governor, but I do think that communication has to be key. When we talk about town meetings and getting together, that is a, that's very difficult in itself because people, for whatever reason, I think that they don't think that there's a real concern when they express uh, what their issues are, that maybe it's not taken seriously, and then people are too busy. But I think with the governor, if there is a problem with the relationship, it has to be communication. And, and actually telling her, you know, what is the need? What is our current need for community health? And making sure that it is, again, communicated to the governor. governor. Thank you, Ms. Bell. Mr. Brightwell. I will, I will lean very heavily on our state representative and our state senator to get the message out that Southfield is interested in getting the governor to improve the uh, community health in the city of Southfield. Uh, that's why they are there and uh, to communicate with the, with the governor. But I would do a local part too. I would galvanize the local community, the individuals who are interested in this particular issue. We will have town hall meetings and we will get a letter program going to the governor. And that move, I, know, I know that moves people in Washington when they get letters. And I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm fairly certain that if we can get a ton of letters going to the governor, going to our state reps and the state senator, about this particular item, it would make things happen. But the first thing I would do would communicate um, our desires with our you know, local representative. And I know um, our, our senator and state rep, they periodically come to Southfield and we, have, we can meet with them and, and share that, that message with them. Thank you, Mr. Brightwell. Ms. Denson. Thank you. Um, first, we need to know how we fare in terms of the community. Um, we have a um, Department of um, Human Services. However, that that the the resources to that or to that department has been cut a lot. Um, 
I, when I went, I mean, when I came here, I think it was two or three, no, like four or five people in that department. Now it's just one, and she's a, and she does a wonderful job, but she cannot do it alone. Mm -hmm. um, so, in terms of, um, in terms of um, working with the governor, we need to first assess what we have and don't have. Um, and also, um, I, ha I, I produce a, 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 um, a um, TV, I mean a, tab a cable station, a cable program to d discuss um, different disabilities, um, physical or mental d disabilities, and you you will be surprised at how much how many people are suffering, but they don't know how to get the resources to help them or or um, family members. But so so. I'm saying before we talk to the, um, the governor, we need to assess what we have and don't have. Thank you, Ms. Denson. Okay, a new question. We'll start with Ms. Morris for this one. Um, this question came in twice. Uh, this may not be quite in city council's purview, but I'm gonna ask it since it came in tw uh, from two different places. We have 12 candidates to choose from versus eight under the previous arrangement. Would you be open to bringing back primaries? Mm. <laughs> yes. Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, I was not in agreement with the cancellation of the primaries four years ago. I just think it's anti-democratic um, and uh, it's really a form of, of virtual voter suppression. I uh, am happy to be here tonight. This is the first time that I've heard from most of the uh, uh, candidates here. And so other residents, they don't get the opportunity to do that. And I think that um, as a resident, you uh, have the uh, right uh, to have the opportunity to uh, choose who you want to best represent you. And so uh, I am definitely in favor of bringing the primaries back. And in fact, I, I will be advocating for that. I've already met with the city clerk to talk about um, how we can look at bringing that back on the ballot. It's fair, it's democratic, and it's uh, just the right thing to do. Thank you, Ms. Morris. Ms. Poole. So I was definitely not in favor of us not having a primary either. And as I've canvassed the neighborhoods, one of the questions that is repeatedly asked is, what happened to the primary. So a lot of residents aren't even aware that we only have a November election. And I agree as well that it is a part of the democratic process and it allows our residents to see the candidates up close and personal for the primary and then make a final decision for the final election. So I would definitely be in favor of us reinstituting the uh, primary election and hopefully that'll happen. Thank you, Ms. Poole. Ms. Hubble. So I'm going to keep my answer short. Yes, I would like a primary, and I would also like to implement ranked choice voting, which is coming through in a lot of communities, and I think that's a really good way to exercise democracy and engage voters regularly. Thank you, Ms. Hubble. Mr. Hill. I can't explain ranked choice voting in like a minute, so that's why I didn't explain it, so I apologize, and if you want to talk afterwards, we can talk. Thank you. Mr. Hill. I'll keep it short and simple. We were trying to save money at that one time, and I believed in that. However, I thought, wrong. It was against the democratic process, and so we need to bring back the primary. But I wanted to go back to one other question, if mm -hmm. you, sure. yes, we can. Um, when we talked about the decision to have a good, the government um, knowing the governor, there was a decision made, and I want to explain something. Community health is also part of the mental health issues and so the governor Engler made a decision to close down some of the mental health facilities back in 95 and they're seeing that with that closure 
more people are in the street, more people are homeless, and more people are self-medicating because they don't have proper mental health. And that's an area that we do need to have those conversations with our governor to possibly open up more mental health facilities to take care of those patients because that's where it's increasing drug use, opioid use, because they're trying to self-medicate in the homeless population. Just wanted to pass that along. Thank, Thank you. you, Mr. Hill. Mr. Hoskins. Um, yes, as, as my colleagues have said, you know, we were running the risk of having potentially 19 people uh, running for the general election. And I think it, it was, uh, as Mr. Hill said, um, you know, we were trying to save money, um, but now that we see what actually happened when, the, when, the, when we actually uh, started this, I think a primary would have been good to be able to uh, get information out earlier and be able to really vet uh, candidates. Thank you, Mr. Hoskins. Mr. Johnson. Um, I agree that we should have had a primary election. And that's because, like Jason just said, we should have more time to vet our candidates. Uh, candidates would have started a lot earlier than they have. Um, you would have had an opportunity to learn a lot more about them. And I also think that it's just a lot to have 12 people on the ballot for you to choose from. Thank you, Mr. Johnson. Okay, this will be the last group of questions. Who, let me poll you guys. Who among you is going to use a minute to address things that you haven't already had a chance to address? Okay, all right, I have a plan. Okay, um, our next question, we're gonna start with Ms. goodwin Dye, And the question is, what is your plan to help public schools provide enhanced education programs? My plan to help public education enhance advanced education is to involve our businesses. As Ms. Yabo said, we have given the businesses here a lot of abatements. They have not taken the time to give back to this community. Southfield, I moved to Southfield because of the school districts, as well as it made me feel like home. I grew up in Monroe. I'm a country girl at heart, and Southfield made me feel at home. As well as the school districts. When I came here in 1989, um, Southfield was rated very high in education. All of my children, except for one, graduated from Southfield schools. And the businesses have an opportunity to in, encourage and engage with our young people and supply the needs that are necessary for them to succeed. So my plan would be to encourage the businesses um, when they're coming in, part of their abatement would be to take on a school project to educate our kids. Thank you, Ms. goodwin Dye. Ms. Banks. Thank you. Um, first of all, I think we have um, excellent and wonderful schools in the city of Southfield, and we are two separate governing bodies. I think <laughs> it's important that the city council and the school board work together to identify what are the needs that we as a city could assist them with to enhance the education process. Yes, we can um, work with our businesses, but there may be other areas that we also can help and assist with. Um, some people say our school district <coughs> isn't that good, but I disagree. And I think it also all starts at home. And if we have students that need additional help or assistance, maybe the um, businesses or the colleges, college students can work together in tutoring to help our students. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Banks. Ms. Bell. Partnershiping. Partnership with the businesses in the area, whether it be mentorships, cadet programs, internships, shadow programs. When you start with the youth, you can teach them at an early age about economics, about the finances, even identifying a career choice. I remember the junior achievement, and we started that with uh, elementary students, teaching them about economics and, and how to budget, I think is essential. And I do believe that there are businesses out there that want to partner. So I think that's the key, is partnership. 
Thank you, Ms. Bell. Mr. Brightwell. Could you repeat the question, yeah. please? What is your plan to help public schools provide enhanced education programs? I would pretty much, what, what, we, what I have done when I was council president, I arranged a meeting with the uh, Southfield School Board and also working with the superintendent. And also we can reach out to the businesses to make sure they have more intern programs here in the city of Southfield. And I have also partnered, not necessarily partnered with, but I had a, a relationship with a, a trade union here in the city of Southfield. They wanted to do an apprentice program here in the city of Southfield. And I'll be pushing that from a standpoint getting young, in, young individuals in at, a, at the 10th grade level, determining whether or not they might, this is a p profession that they might want to want to get into. But I will definitely work with the, um, the superintendent and the school board. I will foster more meetings with the uh, school board. We have, uh, I have uh, obviously arranged those meetings. I arranged a meeting with LTU. So it's a function of communicating and letting uh, those two entities like it was indicated by Ms. Banks, we're two separate bodies, mm -hmm. but by communicating, we can indicate the desire because the uh, good schools actually grow the city of Southfield. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Mr. Brightwell. Ms. Dunson. Thank you. Um, like one of the um, panelists said, um, we give we give a lot of and bake and bake. And abatements um, however and, and it is and it's all good however we need to um, implement some some type of um, community benefit uh, agree agreements and one of the agreements could be um, something with the schools um, I don't know if if the city have has talked about it um, what, um, in the past, but um, uh, CBOs are are needed in ter in, um, in terms of how how is the community benefiting. From the um, abatements that we are giving to the um, the businesses. Thank you, Ms. Dunson. Mr. Fracassi. Yeah. Uh, number one, I think that proposal A has just really hurt the city. I don't know if a lot of you know that uh, they've taken our tax dollar out of the city for the schools and they give them to other units around the state, and that's got to stop. Uh, you had to replace about 19 mills, I guess, to the schools, and that's how much was taken from them. And the other thing is that maybe we could take some of our property back. Where Northland is, that whole area, those taxes go to Oak Park. And I think it's about time that they square off that school district so that we get that money from our, our border to border, in other words, that Oak Park doesn't take advantage as they have with Northland. I think there's a friend, I know see a friend, Myron Frazier is here, councilman, and he remembers Bill Russell. We had a great uh, person that was really working with the schools and getting the young people involved, and, uh, and that was a big, big advantage to the city. The other thing is, I think we have to have more meetings with the schools. I think we only had one meeting this year so far with the school district. We're going to do that more often. Thank you, Mr. Fracassi. Okay, last question, and then we'll move on to the open section. Um, we're going to start with Ms. Poole for this question. Um, the census is short workers. How do you propose to help the government hire enough workers to make sure the census is accurate? I think that there's a misnomer as it pertains to the importance of the census and the impact that it has to our local communities. So I would suggest to having a town halls and forums on a regular basis prior to October 2nd, I believe it is, or whenever the date is approaching, to inform the public of the importance of the census and the impact that it has 
on our community in terms of dollars and what we will lose if you're not a participant in the census. I know that that's a sensitive issue, particularly uh, for those that are immigrants and uh, perhaps may not want to participate in the census for fear of being outed or asked to leave the country. However, I do think that information and communication is key. Thank you, Ms. Poole. Ms. Habo. So I'm on the Commission on Senior Adults in Southfield, and I've been on that commission for the past two years. And one thing that I found is that there are a lot of people who want jobs but can't get them because of age discrimination. And so one thing that I would try to do is first use technology to try to reach out to as many people as possible to let them know about the opportunities. And then I would also use if we're able to do a student liaison program where we have students go door to door because there are some people in our community who aren't comfortable with technology and reach them where they live and we can just advocate for the importance of the census and also relay that there are jobs available and many seniors have fixed incomes and having another form of income even if it's a part-time job doing the census is something that would be really helpful to fill in that gap especially if you have chronic illness and you have medications and you get into that Medicare gap. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Habo. Mr. Hill. Can I address the question before that? Address sure, that? yeah. Okay. <clears throat> the question before that was advanced education. Education is very important to me. And with our youth, we need to give them all the advantages possible. That's why I work with my brother's keeper program. It's a program put on by President Obama to kind of guide at-risk youth. And people move to a community because of education, location, and housing. And we need a closer relationship. I, I, I know it's two separate entities, as Mr. Banks stated, that it's two separate entities with the school board and the council. But there should be a much better working relationship because you increase tax dollars, you get more youthful people coming into the community when you have a great educational system. That's one of the ways you can bring the youth back. It's another way to enhance the learning process. And if we have just a little bit better relationship with the superintendent <coughs> um, and the businesses to sponsor some of those programs, I've heard that they've been taking government out of the schools. That's terrible. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Hill. Mr. Hoskins. <coughs> But as far as the census goes, I mean, it's crucially important that we count every single person. That is federal dollars that, are, that will be coming to uh, our state and our city. Uh, it's something that was so important that the governor was actually in this very chamber trying, uh, announcing an initiative to get more census, uh, census workers. Um, and I think it's something that uh, my colleagues kind of touched on it, making sure we talk to our students making sure we talk to our seniors, making sure we get the word out that they're paying jobs for, uh, out there for people who need them. Um, these are something, and these are jobs that are vitally important for us to make sure that we get every bit of money that is available to us. Thank you, Mr. Hoskins. Mr. Johnson. When it comes to the census, we have to meet people where they are. We have to be in high schools recruiting seniors to work these jobs. We have to be um, on our college campus. We have to be tabling out in the Ever Center property, just like we do for the To The Beat concerts, um, so that people know that these things are happening. And we should also have the ability to send mail to our voters um, or to our constituents and let them know that these things are happening and that they do have an opportunity to earn money in that way. Um, the other uh, when it, as it pertains to the public schools and enhancing public education, my platform calls for starting a citywide internship and jobs program, similar to what Detroit does with the Grow Detroit Youth Talent Program, connecting young people to opportunities in the city, small and large businesses, as well as opportunities within the government itself. A lot of them don't want to stay here once they graduate because they don't feel like opportunities are available because they're interested in something like fashion, for example. But there are companies, small businesses here, that can help them with that sort of thing. And also, there are, there's a Fortune 500 company that deals with that sort of thing as well. So they just don't know about the opportunities until we take them directly to them. Thank you, Mr. Johnson. Ms. Morris. Yes, with regards to the census, I know that the uh, city is going to be establishing its uh, complete count committee and uh, strategizing on the best ways uh, to get the word out. I mean, every 
uh, resident has to be counted uh, because there will be federal funds that will be lost. I think it's estimated at approximately $1,800 per year for 10 years. And so um, there are a lot of resources that will, um, you know, people will not have access to without those funds. So we really need to get the word out. Um, with regards to another question related to Northland, is this the time to talk? About oh, we're, you're going to have another chance. Oh, okay. All right. Okay. Thank you. So you're done? Okay. All right. Mm -hmm. So there was, this is what I want to do for this um, minute that, I, that we're going to give you to address anything else. Several questions came in having to do with character and teamwork. So we combine that into one question. I'm going to ask that question. So you have a chance to address that because it's important to the residents to know how you feel about this topic. And also have some time to address whatever you want to address that you didn't get a chance to address. You'll also have a closing statement too. So you've got a couple minutes to get some more um, words in. Does that sound okay? Okay. Um, this is a little bit long because we combined like five questions, but uh, bear with me here. And remember, you can address this question and also whatever else that you want to address in this minute coming up, okay? As a council member, how would you hold other council members and yourself uh, responsible and accountable in terms of ethical behavior, responsibility for preparedness and participation in council business, and willingness to work with other council members for the residents of Southfield? So if you could address that question, and then also this is your chance to um, address whatever else you want to address, and we'll start with Ms. Banks. Thank you. Um, for, um, I believe the city presently has an ethical ordinance, and um, council has our ethical rules and procedures, which council has adopted. And maybe they just, um, if there's a problem, we need to enforce that a little more and with them amongst each other. Um, and in working with other council people, I have found it very interesting. There's different types of um, tests that you can take out there to determine your personality and what kind of person you are and how you think. And I think it's um, important that as a team, we all try to understand exactly how people think so we can all work together um, based you know, on the results of the different um, tests or the results of the outcome of the um, tests that are out there. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Ms. Banks. Ms. Bell. Yes, um, the city charter specifies the, the responsibilities of the city council. And I think it's the checks and balances, and it's being able to speak up. It's, it's being able to say what's right and wrong without uh, any repercussions. You may be the only person that is in a disagreement, but, but stand and make sure that you continue having the integrity, even though, um, like I said, you may not be able to get along with people. Hopefully, we have a, a city council that is diversified, mm -hmm. that you can communicate, and I think that's the best thing. But remember that we do have a city charter where it, it outlines all the responsibilities, and we have to make sure that we are fair and consistent and that we follow the guidelines that are within the city charter. Thank you, Ms. Bell. Mr. Brightwell. Yes, we have uh, rules and regulations, uh, rules of conduct for council. But as uh, council president, I actually um, implemented a process of actually communicating uh, with council people uh, about some issues. Uh, the way I went about it, the same way I would, since this is a collegial group, I've got another senior uh, council member to go to be with me. And uh, we would uh, talk to the council person with respect to what issues we were dealing with. And that was resolved very amiably. It was uh, friendly and everybody left the room happy and understanding that that was an issue. But we talked about it and I, something that I've used all my life, uh, even when I, I went in the military at an early age, I got a lot of leadership starting at 18. And so uh, I know that sitting down talking with someone, just laying out the various parameters. But the key thing there was it wasn't only me. I had another individual with me, and we both indicated that this is not a, um, this is not a, a crucifixion. This is a process of trying to, to work through an issue, and it worked. Thank you, Mr. Brightwell. Ms. Denson. Thank you. Um, as I sit on 
the uh, Planning Commission, and I have to ta tackle um, some similar um, issues as, um, as, I mean, as well as the, the, the same as the council. And sometimes I'm asking the questions, but nobody's answering the questions. And sometimes I think that because I'm not a council person, they don't feel that I, that they are not accountable to me as a resident, as a resident and a commissioner. Um, I think that we have to tighten up in terms of the policies, the procedures, the processes, and the practices of everything, um, I think that we we in, ter in terms of a community, we have been used to being Southfield. Well, Southfield has changed a little, and we have to make sure that we are in tune with all of the, the residents, not just some of the residents. Thank you, Ms. Denson. Mr. Fricasi. Well, I think that uh, the city council works well together. Works well together. Uh, there's times, of course, when you know, have differences of opinion. I, I usually end up with a 6-1 vote, I lose. But, but you know, that happens. It's, but sometimes, you know, they, uh, uh, you know, they work hard as well as I do. And I do a lot of homework. On, I think Ms. Banks can tell you how many times I ever missed a, a meeting. But some of my background tells me that I have to put my word into to it. Things like Northland, uh, the city center, what I think should be the right development. And I try to explain it. You know, I have the background for it, and I've laid on the table. You want to listen, that's fine. But I, I think that we, together on items, we work together. This marijuana thing is presently being for it. I think that council are looking at it real close. I'd like to see them look closer at it, because there's only two cities in the state of Michigan that have the same uh, ordinance that we're working on. So it doesn't give you much of a look, see it, see what the other ones are doing. Thank you very much for all of you being here. Thank you, Mr. Fakasi. Ms. goodwin Dye. Thank you. In my position as president, I've dealt with so many different um, backgrounds and personalities. And what I've learned from that is that you have to take them as individuals. You always have to be honest about what the issue is. You can't baby it but you have to be respectful when you address it. All of us should be held to a higher standard because we've chosen to represent the residents of Southfield. And if we go out into the communities and we are misbehaving, the residents are gonna look at that and many times you're guilty by association. So we're responsible for each other as well. Thank you, Ms. goodwin Dye. Ms. Habo. One of the most important things to my campaign is being accessible, being accountable, and being transparent. And one way that you can hold me accountable is if you have my flyer, my cell phone's on it, call me. I want you to know that I'm somebody that you can reach out to. And even if I can't do something for you, I'll be honest and I'll tell you that I can't. And one of the things that I've been able to, to work on um, with other residents is that city council meetings are now more, the city council members at the meetings are now more accessible because you don't have to sign up in advance to speak at city council meetings. You can sign up 
day of the meeting and speak at the city council meetings. And another procedure that I'd like to see changed is how frequent the citizens are able to speak. I'd like our meetings to begin with uh, residents speaking and then also end with residents speaking because now an entire meeting has gone by and you might have questions about what we just discussed. And I want to make sure that you're able to ask those questions and you're able to reach out to your government officials. Thank you, Ms. Habo. Mr. Hill. As a trainer, I've learned the importance of teamwork. You have to have teamwork in any organization, any government facility to get anything done. If you don't, it's just chaos. And as a biomedical trainer with five states, I've learned that people have different communication styles and skills. And you should learn that to understand how to get the job done. Because at the end of the day, the first thing that you want to have done is the will of the people. That's why we're here. That's why we should be here. And if you think about that first, what's important to the residents? And we should get them to chime in to let us know what's important. So teamwork is the main thing. You have seven council people. It takes four votes to get anything done. And you need to be on the winning side of that and have the will of the people as the most important part. Because we have 70,000 residents to look out for. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Hill. Mr. Hoskins. So I work in an office that has made it its mission to make sure your government is more open, accountable, and transparent. Um, according to a, a, non -policy th a, a nonprofit think tank known as the Center for Public Integrity, Michigan government ranks dead last as far as uh, its uh, accountability and transparency in government. If you try to get information out of your government, you can't. Uh, trying to find out information dealing with campaign finance uh, is difficult. And so we've been working on uh, legislation dealing with um, subjecting the, the governor's office and uh, the state legislature to FOIA and a number of things that we're slowly going to be rolling out. But that's where I come from in my governance. I want to make sure that your government is accountable, uh, is uh, always uh, transparent, that you always know what you're going to be doing because we are held, we as government officials are held at higher standards. And as I am currently a government official, I mean, you hold me accountable right now. You can, because well, if I do something bad, it looks bad on my boss. Um, and so I always make sure that I am tr I'm serving you the best that I can. Thank you, Mr. Hoskins. Mr. Johnson. I think that the city should have an ethics board made up um, partially or all or completely of citizens. Um, the government shouldn't be able to self-regulate uh, and decide their own ethics or decide what the issues were with their own ethics related decisions on their own. Um, and the next piece is making sure that our, our website should provide all the information that you could possibly need. Um, I used to work for the state legislature. The legislature's website, you can see all of the different projects and bills that they're working on, and you can see different updates on what it is that they're doing. I think that's something that would be very beneficial for our community. So you can just check online, look into a specific issue that you're concerned about, and then see what's happening with that issue. Thank you, Mr. Johnson. <coughs> Ms. Morris. So I am a person of high ethics and morals, and I would want those character traits uh, in uh, my city council colleagues as well. Uh, I believe it's important to know uh, what we are responsible for, what we are allowed to do. I, I remember hosting the uh, town hall on the roads, and someone came up to me and said that um, I violated the ethics policy because I uh, used city property. and. Um, I said, okay, so I read the ethics policy. The city does have an ethics policy, and clearly in there it states that a council person has a right to educate the community quarterly on uh, various topics. And so immediately I called for the ethics policy to be placed on the website so that the residents would know, as well as other council members would know, what uh, we were responsible for doing. So that called for uh, transparency as well as accessibility in terms of educating um, our residents. Thank you, Ms. Morris. Ms. Poole. Integrity and accountability is part of the impetus for me running for city council. Integrity and accountability speaks to who you are as an individual. And although there are code of ethics that govern the city council, I believe that 
within a team, any team, there has to be mutual respect and levels of, account of accountability within that team. Should an occasion arise where there is a lack of integrity, I believe that it is incumbent upon us as a team to address it, address it with diplomacy and tact and deal with the situation. Um, as a member of the city council, we set precedents for the way that the rest of the citizens respond to issues. If we feel like we can circumvent processes and be someone different than who we are and when we're serving, then the city will do likewise. Thank you, Ms. Poole. Okay, <coughs> we're in the home stretch, everybody. I know it's been a long night, so thanks for hanging in there. Um, now we are at the closing statements portion of the evening, so you have a minute to uh, give a closing statement. We're going to go in reverse alphabetical order, so Ms. Poole, you're up again. Sure. So may I address the advancement of education? Sure. Okay, sure. So I believe that education could be enhanced, certainly through multicultural stakeholders as businesses and higher education. However, we all know that the key to academic achievement is tied to funding. So I would suggest that perhaps we do some competitive as well as non-competitive grants to further fund schools that are struggling and reward schools that are not. Thank you, Ms. Poole. Yeah. Ms. Morris. For the past 21 years, I've ran a nonprofit organization dedicated to helping people improve their lives, and this is truly part of my DNA. I care about all the people of Southfield and the future of our city. I feel truly blessed to be able to help people by addressing their concerns and solving their problems. I have enjoyed serving the residents of Southfield these past four years with passion and hard work. I am a person of high character and morals and will continue to exhibit the highest integrity and ethics in government. These character traits are needed now more than ever. I will continue to fight for what matters most to the residents. I have demonstrated leadership that produces results. In 2015, I was a top vote getter and your confidence in me has paid off for the community. Let's continue the progress by reelecting me again for 2019. For more information about me and my vision for our great city, please visit my website at tanyamorris.com and I look forward to your vote November 5th. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Uh, Mr. Johnson. Southfield is a wonderful community, um, but there are improvements that we need. Our campaign, we're focused on three primary issue areas. The first one is our students and our young people, as I mentioned earlier. I've actually been endorsed by three members of the school board um, because they trust me to work with them as a valued partner. I'd like to work with them to build a citywide internship and jobs program to provide opportunities for our young people. I'd like to invest in our neighborhoods by making sure that our residents continue our older and low income residents continue to receive um, lower no interest funds to make repairs to their homes. That's especially important because we want to make sure that those residents are able to stay in their homes and age in place, but we also want to make sure the homes are well maintained for future generations like my own who might want to buy a house in Southfield someday. And the last thing is our small businesses. So bringing more um, locally owned small business establishments to this community and making it easier for Southfield residents to start small businesses in Southfield and giving them a larger stake in the community. Because a lot of the businesses here are owned by people that don't even live here. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Johnson. Mr. Hoskins. Uh, I want to thank the League of Women Voters for putting on this great event. Um, we, when I was graduating from law school, uh, many of my classmates they were moving on to different places um, because they felt like either there weren't opportunities here in Michigan for them or there were places in Michigan that just didn't serve what they needed. Um, and for me, the choice was clear. I was going to stay here uh, in my community, in Southfield, work in public service and serve it, serve my community. And I've been lucky enough to be able to work for our state legislators um, working on policies that help move our city forward, like making, making sure our neighborhoods are vibrant and livable, making sure that we have those tools for economic development and that our government is open and transparent. And now that, um, now that we have done so many great things, um, I'm, great, great things at the state level, I'm hoping that um, I will have your support and serve as one of your city council members. Um, if you want more information about me, you can go to my website at jasonhoskins.com or go to Facebook at Jason Hoskins for City Council, uh, Southfield City Council. All right. 
Thank you, guys. Thank you, Mr. Hoskins. Mr. Hill. Transparency is very important in decision making in government and wherever. And that's what I bring to the table. I've been coming to these meetings for five years because I thought it was important to be involved, to stand up for what you believe in, ask the people what's important to them, and I presented those cases for over five years. It's not because I didn't have anything better to do, but I think you should always give back and find out what's important. I always told my children, if you see something wrong, stand up and fight for it. And with a biomedical science background, a business degree, I've come to the table and said, hey, there's some things we can do better. Maybe medical marijuana may not be the best idea. Protecting our water is definitely on my agenda because without water, you cannot survive. And we've been doing a good job of that because we have a $68 million millage. We're doing great, but I want to make sure we implement those plans to, for the betterment of our people because keeping us safe is very important. For the health of the city, I ask for your support November 5th. I will continue to fight for you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Hill. Ms. Hubble. I love Southfield. That's why I'm here, and that's why I want to be your attorney representing your interests. I was a student in Southfield Public Schools at Vandenberg, Thompson, and Southfield Lathrop High School. And the values that I learned there are values that I took with me in my career as an attorney. I worked for legal aid, and I served my neighbors. And when I saw a gap in the services that we had in Southfield, I made sure that where I was working, we made another way to serve our neighbors by having first Friday of every month legal services for residents. And if you're over 60, you get free legal aid. And that's an important thing to make sure that we're always taking care of the most vulnerable in our communities. And that's what my career has been. I sit on the board of the National Lawyers Guild, and we make sure that people are protected when they're protesting and they're challenging broken systems. I sit on the board of Hospitality House Food Pantry, and we serve Oakland County residents, making sure that where there are gaps, we fill them in, because it's our responsibility to take care of each other, and I want to take care of my neighbors. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Hubbell. Ms. goodwin Dye. Yes. I would like to support the families and the retirees to make sure that they're getting the things that they need. I would like to encourage young families to come to Southfield. We need to improve our schools. I was doing an interview and a young lady who was a photographer said she was looking for a place to live. And I said, well, did you check out Southfield? She said, yes. I says, well, why didn't you choose Southfield? She says, because of the school districts. Our schools need much improvement. As someone else said on the board, we need to partner more with our school board as well as partner with the businesses to bring this up because families, our young families are not going to come to Southfield if they're not going to be able to educate their children. I have two granddaughters in Southfield right now and they were not getting the assistance they needed because they're my oldest granddaughter's ADD. So we had to find a school outside of the district that could give her what she needed. And I think that it's, it's not good for Southfield if we can't educate our children and give them, especially those with special needs, um, the necessary tools to succeed. Those are the reasons, some of the reasons why I want to run for Southfield City Council, and I hope that you'll vote for me, Ghana Goodwin Dye, on November 5th. Thank you, Ms. Goodwin Dye. Mr. Fercasi. Yes. As mayor, city councilman, council president, I have served the residents of this city in Southfield for a number of years. With my business experience and background in municipal work, I have gained a vast knowledge of how industry and government agencies integrate and work best together. I've had the opportunity to work with the federal government, state government, and county officials. These affiliations have allowed me to bring positive changes to Southfield. I have the ability to understand and envision current and future trends and will continue to work to keep Southfield vibrant and guarantee her bright future. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Fercasi. Ms. Dunson. Okay, hello. Um, my name is Dr. Latina Denson, and, um, and I, w I wish that you would vote for me on um, November 5th. 
Um, I have been serving Southfield since I went, I mean, since I came here seven years ago. Um, I, I have, service is what I do. Um, I was just talking to someone and, and I told them that I, my first internship was with um, the Secretary of State, Richard Austin, and I've been serving ever since. Um, I, I have a PhD in Urban Affairs and Public Policy. I have a, bachelor, a master's in urban planning, and I am a certified urban planner. So when you talk about housing and um, economic development, transportation, I, I have been, I have been um, responsible for that for years. And from for from for many places, and so that's what I do. It's not a job for me. It's not a hard t um, task for me because that's it, that's that's in my blood, and so. Um, Visit me on my um, website, latinadenson.com, and, um, and vote for me, please. <laughs> Thank you, Ms. Dunson. Mr. Brightwell. <clears throat> uh, mm, this guy, I'm, I'm a veteran, and uh, that's one of the best decisions I made when I was a very young person. I come from a large family, and my parents couldn't afford me to go to college, but uh, the military paid for my education. I finished Morehouse, I finished the Warden School, and just recently I finished the Michigan, the very prestigious Michigan Political Leadership Program. I was accepted in that as a 10-month program. They select the future leaders of Michigan, and I, was, I completed that program in 10 months. It was a 10-month program. Since I've been on council, my, my major focus has been the operational health and the financial health of the city. I passed more resolutions than anyone in that four-year span I pass more ordinances than anyone else in that uh, stand, span. My Pacific concentration continue, will continue to be roads and the renovation of the sewers, and also the public safety in the city of Southfield, and also code enforcement. Although I do other things that are operational, those are my primary focus, and those are the things I get calls on frequently, uh, whether or not they be code, roads, and also um, a curb appeal. But I, I enjoy doing what I'm doing, and uh, thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Brightwell. Ms. Bell. The reason that I'm here today is due to unresolved issues that I experienced with the city government. While canvassing, other people shared the same concerns that I had. But if I'm elected to city council, I plan to represent the citizens to the best of my ability by utilizing my God-given talents with the authority invested in me as stipulated in the city charter. I plan to raise the standards by bringing integrity, transparency, consistency, and to be relentless in holding city officials accountable. With a commitment to excellence, I will acknowledge all citizens' concerns in a timely manner. I will bring experience, firm, and committed leadership to the city of Southfield. One of my goals is to retain and expand small businesses, women, and minority business enterprise. My focus will be on safety, education, and beautification of the city. It would be my privilege and honor to work diligently for you on your behalf. Together, Southfield will continue to be a great place to live, work, play, and prosper. When you do nothing, you feel overwhelmed and powerless. But when you get involved, you feel the sense of hope and accomplish accomplishments that comes from knowing you are working to make things better. Maya Angelou, vote for Constance Bell, ring the bell, time for a change. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Bell. Ms. Banks. Thank you. As you heard in my opening statement, Southfield has been my whole life. This election is not about me, Nancy Banks. This election is about we, 
the people of the city of Southfield. Do you want a, per a person who has proven leadership in our city? Do you want a person who is experienced, qualified, and homegrown? Do you want a person with high integrity who is dedicated, knowledgeable, professional, hands-on working knowledge of our budget and in the city? Or do you just want change? I believe that my many years of loyal service as your elected city clerk, my love and commitment to the future of our city makes me a highly qualified choice for Southfield City Council. If you wish to join our campaign, you can contact us at nlmbanks at gmail.com. I hope that you, the people of the city of Southfield, will bank on banks to serve as your next council person. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Banks. Okay, well, the League of Women Voters would like, oh, yes. I didn't have an opportunity to do a closing. I just did the education piece. Oh, I'm sorry. I guess I wasn't clear to you on that. No, um, I'm sorry. I thought you said that we had an opportunity to address any question that we had not. It was prior to that, at the, prior to the closing statement. I gave everybody the option of answering that question or addressing something else. Sure. And then there was a closing statement. I'm sorry. Do you want a quick minute to, sure. to give a closing that's statement? Okay. okay. So again, my name is Tina Marie Poole. And uh, as I stated earlier, I am passionate and committed about serving Southfield and it continuing to be a thriving and vibrant city that is progressive. And I absolutely love the residents of Southfield. The most important part of this process has been engaging with the citizens. It has given me great pleasure and to hear them say some of the things that I am concerned with. I would ask for your vote, understanding that I have a stellar track record of moving initiatives from conceptualization to implementation. I have established networks throughout the community. I have been involved in public service all of my life, in, including uh, visiting nursing homes with youth, with, with um, the business community or the business sector, and so on. I have four main platform uh, agendas, and that includes increased communication between the citizens and government, code enforcement, funding programs for youth and families, assisting our seniors to age in place, and then, of course, last but not least, a high-quality education for all students. I encourage you to visit my website at tinamariepool.com to find out more information. Vote for Tina Marie Pool on November the 5th. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Pool. Okay. The League of Women Voters would like to thank the audience for hanging in with this long forum tonight and the candidates as well. Thank you very much for being here and participating in this uh, forum. Also, the City of Southfield for hosting us and Cable 15 TV for taping this forum tonight. Um, when rebroadcast times are known, the League will post it on our website and I assume it will be on Cable 15's website as well. For further nonpartisan information on these candidates and in other communities that you might be interested in, check vote411.org or lwvoa.org and we'll be getting those uh, voter guides up within the next week to a week and a half. Um, the League of Women Voters is funded by contributions from concerned businesses and citizens like you. Our membership is open to women and men over the age of 16. Remember to vote on November 5th. Democracy is not a spectator sport. Good night, everybody. Thank you very much. Madam Chair, <laughs> Madam Chair, <clears throat> can I make a comment? Can I just have a minute here for a second? I'm sitting in a seat. That's why I want to say something. Myron Frazier is a councilman, been with us yes. 25 years, and he's added so much to the development of the city and what we have and the residents, and I'd like to thank him very much publicly. Yeah.